coaxing commands into Jane's sunglassed face. She responds with a measured quickening of the pace. Not all out, half a length back. Third was not good enough in this race. The oars lift and submerge as the shell surges forward, making of water, churning of water in the cut. The eight-woman crew pull hard in their charge, in control, knees to chest, arms outstretched, legs extended, hands to breast. Beautiful Clyde's dolphins, they are. The small man's dreams are being realized as he speaks clearly to his stroke. Jane, 800 yards to go, keep heart, stay within yourself. He watches her knees lock, then extend. The sun visor nods. Sweat mixes with new rain, streaking the opaque glasses. The relationship is secured. Synchronized oars push through the pocked water. 500 meters, one moment in time, he screams. Jane takes the cue. These galley Amazons take the task. Hearts, arms, chest, legs, blood, row. They bow in exhaustion after crossing the line. The little man throws up his arms, then gently touches Jane's arthroscopic knees. All has been given. Husky women. <laughs> Actually, Jane was a stroke a few years back. When song breezes, they sat naked, unseen by neighbors under the shade of the awning after climbing out of the cedar hot tub. Pink and white apple blossoms from the tree overhead parachuted quietly into the jacuzzi liquid of the wooden pool. A breeze brushed across their legs, which were stretched out into the sunlight of the late afternoon. They had aged together, their children gone, children of their own. A tiny titmouse flew into a bush, rustling the leaves as it did. Another followed. A swallow of potent licorice ooze, though, heightened his senses as he realized his powerful love for her. 25 falls, 25 springs, and their eyes were still the same. She didn't like him to drink, never had. Yet she sipped the yacht's Chardonnay and wondered about that which they had shared. How long would it last? A relationship was another child that was to be nurtured, nourished, and it had been. His bypass had been the last of many crises, and the long time various Sheila's, Colleen's, and Brett's and Lester's had been the others. How long would this thing last until the breeze no longer brushes their naked legs? Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I got into public school teaching, I worked in public health, and usually I was here giving testimony about teen health care. It's really fun to be here today not doing any statistics, but I do want to read one of my poems from my public health years, a little slice of life from the teen clinic. Lost boys in almost town. The car is open-topped but old, convertible, a misleading word for a car open more like a rusty can in the parking lot at White Center Public Health. Inside the oxidized red of the car, two dark-haired boys sleep, flushed cheeks, mouths tilted ajar, their faces gathering the pattern of beaded seat covers. They are 16, maybe 17, waiting for a girl inside to get her depot shot or magic pack of pills. The Blackberry Wild Rose City Edge Hills break through the tarmac, adding their splashes of color to murals splashed at the clinic doorway, Native American inspired, funded by King County one summer to occupy the local rambling youth in wishful summer camp efforts to beautify White Center, Tukwila, SeaTac, Des Moines. The girl leaves the clinic, joins them. They laugh and nestle in the car. She's the sister of one, the girlfriend of the other. Thistle-voiced, husky tone, she begins to tell them the story of her visit. They listen as if to a bedtime tale. Dusk leans in close to the three of them, Wendy talking the lost boys into sleep. They could be waiting for Peter Pan. Will he claim them, raise them in their wreck of a car, stuck like a barnacle with all the little delinquent near towns clinging to the sides of I-5? The interstate flies like a pirate ship into the sky. And I am going
going to have a first grade classroom to teach in on in September. But before you're a teacher, you're a substitute teacher. And uh, this is my pay into those days. Safer than LSD. Pooped, I lie on the couch, boneless as a cat, home from substitute teaching. Today I saw that guy the middle school kids call the mullet for his Randy, Randy Johnson hairdo. Subbing is the perfect job for a woman like me. A little excitement from time to time, safer than LSD, but I'm guessing it's just as wild. They come into the room 25 at a time just before the bell, beautiful, mysterious, and sometimes even dangerous. Then 40 minutes to microwave my lunch and I'm ready for the afternoon. Sometimes the student stands at my elbow. He tells me I remind him of the lady with the cat car. She tells me I taught her to write her first poem. I watch them uncurl, each a fresh leaf, brand new and perfect, then home to reheat the burrito casserole for my family and to tell my 10-year-old daughter, who wants to be a middle schooler when she grows up, the story of my day. I give her the skinny, the fat, the all of it, starting with once upon a time at New Options Middle School. And my last poem today um, goes way back to my Peace Corps days in Sierra Leone, West Africa. Fatu's Cooking. My neighbor skims milk in the moonlight. Her babies sleep to her laugh. An old pa cries, women and snakes at us. But my Sula girlfriend only charms rice from husk in her palm weed basket. I eat from her plate, I eat from her hand, with a dab of cow butter besides. We sit half the night on my Peace Corps chop box while moon glides over milk, mortar and pestle, calabash, ashes from the fire. I see that I will come to you again, if only in pieces. O oh, Fatu, moon face, moon with a pail on your head, I will shed the skin we wore together and wake up wearing it elsewhere. Thank you very much. All right, good afternoon. Um, Rod Tipton is our poet for the afternoon. And Rod graduated from the University of Washington in 1982 with a BA in philosophy and began reading his work in, the Seattle, in Seattle in the mid 80s at Radio Free Leroy's Reading Series. He continues to read in private and public venues, including the Pride Art Museum, published in Tide, Arterial Reader, Urban Spelunker, Arms Extent, Chrysanthemum, and three times in Poets West. I'd like to introduce you to one of the best poets in the city, Rod Tipton. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Nick Licata and Frank Video and everybody else involved. I um, guess we should just jump right to it here, huh? <clears throat> Sorry about that. First one here is called Bar Music. Something charming on the piano. A rolling tune to make you think of a small circus. A slender woman on the rope, agile, balanced, wraps her leg like a snake and hangs in arched glory at a dangerous height, then snaps and twists and lowers herself, uncurling her body on the stool next to yours. Bravo, you shout, and quickly check your wallet, hoping you have enough to buy her a drink. My second poem is called Unlocks Nothing. Why are his fingers so busy with keys when he locks and unlocks nothing? There were proud horses in the street, or maybe just children dressed that way, pawing and stamping at the beginning of a festival. I know you were there. I saw the tear when they released billows of flowers and everyone cheered, and I heard your voice, too, raised high among the clapping hands, clear like a mockingbird, suddenly free of its cage. There were great freedoms passed out by vendors that day, and believe me, some are still good. But he turns off the light, blocks out the sun, and stays in the back, where he keeps a small file with square inches of paper on which he inscribes the initials of people he can make O. And uh, I'll be finishing with a poem called A Gift. <clears throat> I have brought you the present of velvet soft air on a warm day after a night of rain. With two women running down the path, 
the one in white shorts whose name is Linda, that means beautiful in Spanish, daydreaming about dipped ice cream, the thought of which only makes her want to sweat more. Also, a dog on a leash who pulls 10 miles an hour faster than his owner can walk. And the birds with a breeze under their wings, barrel rolling through clouds of insects, free and clear of the ground for what right now seems like the rest of eternity. The day belongs much more to them than me, but still it is my gift to you. So what will you do with the mountains of yellow wrapping paper? And how will you unfold this huge box? I have seen your fingers pause on such occasions, your eyes narrowing with clever questions. But if you will take good advice, as everyone should, you will not allow your new wealth to slip away without holding it in your arms and putting its taste on your lips. Thank you. Thank you, Rock. Very good. And Barnes and Noble. She recently published in Brothers and Others, an anthology of black women writers, and she and I just completed a term, our second term as um, writing workshop in the Monroe State Reformatory Special Offenders Unit, teaching writing and poetry. Brenda Gibbons. I'm going to go ahead by just starting with my first poem, Propensity. She had the propensity to sing, and so she did. It was a lubricant administered against the friction of her daily struggle to survive. Her voice dispersed within the atmosphere like water droplets jetting from a fountain, cooling all who wandered within earshot. Her angelic utterances are healing balm. She had the propensity to express within a single note the corrupt nature flourishing within the world she lived the volatility of those who endured conditions worse than the rats plaguing her children in the soft, moonless light. Deep waters, deeper yet, her spirit rose as her body drifted through the undercurrents day to day. The timbre of her voice rumbled when she moaned in sorrowful relief, and passers-by remarked in awesome veneration, that girl has the propensity to sing. My Woods. Green and shades of green. The palette of heaven and earth are sundry blues and browns and greens. The carpet of leaves deflects the fat droplets falling from the trees, sounding like the drums, sounding like the trains on old tracks, sounding like the footfall of a thousand soldiers marching. You'd have to see, to feel, to experience what I saw. Then you'd know how sweet the air can really feel or just how light and water and green can heal the troubled soul. Not quite tame. Her leather pumps fall softly upon concrete pathways. The breeze moves gently through her wildest hair. No one pays her any mind. They disregard her stormy glimmer. In most ways, she resembles them. In many ways, she takes on human traits. In some ways, she exemplifies tranquility, but in the recesses of her smile, it translates through. She is not quite tame. And last of all, family tree. When I die, there'll be nothing left of me, nothing left of me, nothing left of me, except for a memory inside Ryan, Christopher, and Lindsay. Then I'll gladly climb that tree above those who were free and those bound by slavery. Thank you, Brenda. I'd like thank, to thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Nick. The next uh, speaker is uh, Dennis Wilkin. And Dennis Wilkin, is, um, he's been writing for a long time. He graduated from the University of Cincinnati, honors uh, with degrees in English and Literature. English literature and abnormal psychology and a minor in journalism. Dennis has worked a number of writing assignments from Cincinnati Magazine to Idaho Mountain Express, some TV. Recently it's been Port Orchard Independence to Garden Island in Kauai, Hawaii. And he's been published all over the place. And um, 
I think he's one of the better sorts, and he does, right now he's writing for independent newspapers around the city. Um, also Dennis, um, Dennis Wilkins, Rod Tipton, and Kelly Riggle-Hauer, all former readers here, will be performing at um, Whitson on the Ave this coming Friday on the 27th at 7.30 at night. Dennis Wilkins. Whiskey Bear. Beauty is in the wish that chokes on ancient fears and drowns in nightly whiskey bear. Women, objects of these ethereal desires, crush the life of dreams, domesticity is left unchanged. Gutted, the romantic men live on, reading poetry to each other only girls can understand. This is called Ports. Feelings, architect of motives, cheapened by words, hide behind any available mood, however inarticulate. What I want can never lie down with what I say. There is no bed wide enough to contain the distance between desire and its interpreters. We start as babes, screaming our wishes into the mummified air, frightened only the first few times a substitute appears. One loves the plastic nipple and the breast, or one dies. This is like an old, I always like all these old sayings. You'll probably hear a bunch of them here today. History. A person who can't remember is doomed to do something, but for the life of me, I can't remember what the hell it is. <laughs> Chicago, who's kind of town? I'm not a fan. I kind of like Seattle. You'll be able to tell. Oblivious to the silver train flashing by, an old man, purple skin, shining like a doused eggplant in the muggy May sunshine, kneels and picks through mud-stained garbage, looking for something to salvage from a city perverse in its ugliness. Mean and past its prime, same broad shoulders running to brutal stained backs. And uh, I've always owned dogs when I live in small places like Hawaii and Idaho, and I'm always astounded at how dogs do anything you tell them, and that sort of stimulated this. Dogdom's murky depths. There, where thoughts are grooved by instinct, sticks are chased off cliff, out airplane windows, and during the fall, ears blown back, tongue protruding, the tail keeps wagging. Splat, doggone. The price of unconditional love starts very high and often brings you low, very low. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you. I will now ask uh, Dottie Norris, who's our poet curator, to introduce our poet today. Thank you, Nick. Today's poet is Anne-Marie Hackenberger. Anne-Marie was born and raised in East Germany, which is up, that part is Polish now. After studying German, history, and English in Bonn and Heidelberg from 1945 to 1950 and teaching for five years, she immigrated with her husband and first son to the U.S. in 1956. She raised four children, later substituted in different high schools, then did postgraduate studies at the UW. From 1973 to 86, she taught at a school in Freiburg, Germany, and came back to this country in 1987. She's had a volume of her poetry published in Berlin, and Anne-Marie Hackenberger. Anne. Thank you. Beauty. I see beauty in everything in a single leaf lying on the ground, in a bird flapping his wings and frolicking in my bird bath, in the bizarre formation of a cloud, in the smile of a mother looking at her child, in the twinkling of an old man's eye, in the sounds of a string quartet, in a line of a poem, in the emerald velvet of my lawn, in the raindrops glistening on roofs and wires, in the doe-like eyes of my dog, in the innocent faces of my grandchildren, in the perfection of a single rose. That's why my life is so rich, because I see beauty in everything. Water music. Swimming in the slow lane, just the right place for someone 63, the water is clear and calm, pleasant and warm. Long, long ago, two people swimming in one lane, the water calm and pleasant, two instruments are in tune with each other, a melody of love. Soon, ripples, splashes, undercurrents, 
discourse. Two people swimming in two lanes, the instruments out of tune, broken strings. Years going by. Two people swimming with one lane between them, then running out of lanes. The clanging sound of brass and cymbals, no lanes in the ocean, and the water is cold and wild and full of white caps. Unbearable dissonances, shrill sounds that hurt the ears, that hurt the hearts. A crescendo of pain. One hits bottom, yet keeps coming up for air. The other stays afloat, barely at first, soon getting a grip on a buoy, trusting the man who stilled the waters, trusting the man who calmed the sea. The next generation, two people swimming in one lane, two instruments in tune with each other, a melody of love. No repeats, please. For God's sake, no da capo al fine. Healing. Some time ago, I wrote a poem that began, Once upon a time, my love was a tree. And it told a story. How beautiful this tree was, how it was almost destroyed by another tree that fell on it and broke it into pieces. But still, it gave nourishment to the four small trees that grew around it. However, as time went by, there was too much hail and thunder and lightning. The tree that was love almost died, then recovered, wilted again, blossomed again. And so it went on through many years. Two years ago, I wrote this line. Sitting here on the warm beach in Hawaii, there is winter in my heart. Today, experiencing joy and healing, friendship, beauty, sharing, I am writing, sitting here on the cold beach of Puget Sound, there is spring in my heart. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you very much, Anne Marie. is Diana Brennan. She's a local journalist and poet. She writes a human interest column and book review for the Jewish Transcript, Washington State's only Jewish newspaper. She has been a featured poet at Wits End Bookstore in Fremont, and her poem, Blackberries, will be published in the June 2002 Poets West Literary Journal. A Seattle resident since 1982, she lives in the North End with her husband and two sons. Diana? Thank you, Dobby. I'm going to be reading four short poems, all set in Western Washington. Breakfast Surprise. We had our breakfast on the beach, early morning waves flip-flapping, sounds of baby nursing, dogs laughing, startled mountains flushed, scarlet pink surprise, blackberries, sourish and sweet, only a very few in reach. We separated fruit from seed with tongues that swept instinctively and teeth that knew to bite exploringly. We paced the thorny buffet line, dodged sea jelly dinner plates, clear or red, waiting for a rescue tide. There is always one big seed inside to spit into the bushes. Evie's Landing. This summer rain is a waste. The earth has lost its birth soft sponginess of spring, has sucked down, locked up, drawn tight its hard shell. This summer rain is a waste. For all its force, it merely trickles in rivulets down the felted grass. No root, no plant gets the sippiest sip. This summer rain is a waste. The only thing it benefits is the sea. Evening news. Sunset. Crows are laughing, orange like the sky, blocking black on gray light, home to homing like a bell calls. Call, call. Tall trees talking, loud, up the ridge, cawing black like lines tight, end of day.
day new, pinkly streaked, brushed light and blue, crowns of thunder, talking, talking, talking. And finally, back to the beach, beach road walk. Startled by my own reflection in window glass across the street, the marching crunch of walking feet, houses sandwiched side by side, water rushling, rushing, rippling tides, low or high, and mudflats sulfur stink. Three herons take up their formation, arranged by lengths to fish along the undulating water line, retreating fast across their feet. Water trips them with moon dances, hurries to marry the deeper sea. Sun and wind and water bounce a beach ballet upon each pane. Houses crowd against the water, pushing up along the beach, jostling for their line position, and those shouldering across the street are jealously advancing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. I am Dobby Norris, and I'm the board curator for this committee. Um, today's poet is Sandra Larkman Heinzen. Sandra lives in a rural setting within the Seattle city limits beside Thorny Creek. She publishes a newsletter for the Thorny Creek Alliance, which works to restore and nurture the watershed of Thorny Creek Basin. She has been performing poetry live since 1970 in Bellingham, Seattle, and Vancouver. Sandra has won awards from the Washington Association of Poets, the Chester H. Jones Foundation, and the National Council of Teachers of English. Installation and forms of art with her poems have appeared in Wayne Luke Asian Museum, Home Movie, and the University Friends Gallery. Poetry of Art on, and Art on Buses. Sandra. Thank you, Dobby. Well, uh, with that introduction, you won't be surprised that uh, these three short poems are about Thornton Creek, Seattle's largest creek system. And before I read the first one, I have to tell you that I used my poet's <coughs> license. I said river rather than creek for the meter in this particular poem, but it really is Thornton Creek. The trees drink the river, the river drinks the trees. Looking down in summer, you can see what looking up the river sees. The trees drink the river, the river drinks the trees. In summer, swallows swoop and rise from river run to trees and in between. The trees drink the river, the river drinks the trees. In fall, the waters rise and leap to capture autumn's fallen floating leaves. The trees drink the river, the river drinks the trees. In winter, water washes stones and trees roots wait like river's arbor bones. The trees drink the river, the river drinks the trees. Looking down in summer, you can see what looking up the river sees. Now on the Thornton Creek system, at this point we have as many as nine different kinds of ducks alone. Uh, but the first and most long-standing waterfowl are the mallards. Mallard, mallard in the stream, through new green grass your green head gleams, while feathered fair your wife wears brown. None ever could improve your helmet and her gown. Wending water swelled with rain, whose silvered currents are your train. You make your progress, king and queen, afloat, brown madam, mallard green. And last, you would never think that something as wild a creature as an otter was living in the Seattle city limits, but we have seen them several times on the creek and in this poem at Meadowbrook Ponds, which is a beautiful installation that is a public access part of the Thornton Creek system. Like a little water monster, undulating over underwater, pausing in a plane where no other creature could be stopping, was an otter. There, like the line of thread, the needle pushes up and out the cloth, silvered in its water fabric, liquid sewing with its spine, there again, it's swimming, stopping. There again, it's bright eye, eye. There in pause from water weaving, circles from its stillness ride. Circle after circle out scouts, breath in breath, we three hold soft. Only us, the water, otter, only water, only sky. In the ocean of our city, in the circle of our pond, in the warp of once only rode an otter little wonder monger, 
shuttle, water winder, otter. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sean. Very nice. Today's poet is J. Glenn Evans. Jack has written two books of poetry, Window in the Sky and Seattle Poems, and a novel, Broker, Broker Jim, soon to be released by First Books. He has written several histories under the name of Jack R. Evans. A former stockbroker, investment banker, he has engaged in mining and co-produced the movie Christmas Mountain featuring Slim Pickens. Poetry editor and publisher of Poets West Literary Journal and the managing director of Poets West Reading Series conducted at the Fry Art Museum four times a year. J. Glenn Evans and Barbara Evans were jointly awarded the 1999 Faith Beamer Cook Award by Washington Poets Association in recognition of service to the poetry community of Washington State. Listed in Who's Who in America, Who's Who in the World, He's a member of the Academy of American Poets, and he's all around everything for poetry around here. Jack. Thank you, Dobby. The first poem I chose to read is called Memory, sometimes called Morphic Man. At one time, I was a stockbroker and investment banker, and I got involved in the mining business, and that's what inspired this poem, Memories of Morphic Man. Snow began to fall, the north wind made it cold. I just stepped off the Greyhound bus in the mining town of Wallace, Idaho. A half a block to the north, I saw the depot of Burlington North, all closed and dark. I walked the opposite way. The lights of Sweet's Cafe came into view through the falling flakes. Slightly tilted, standing in front, was a strange man who looked like Morford Man. He stood there in the cold, old, shriveled, and gray. Three days' growth of beard stained by juice of tobacco. Thirty years since last I'd seen this Morford man. What was Morford man doing way out west? We both grew up in the east, mortal enemies then. He terrorized my childhood, bloody my nose on school ground, chased me home from school and bullied me so, this Morford man. He stood in direct line of my approach. I stopped in front of Sweet's Cafe and looked him in the eye. I said nothing, just looked at him with a glare. He looked back, and I expected a poke where it could even be put to the touch. I could see his mind from ten to years. His eyes brightened like he had seen a long lost friend. Tears came into his eyes. His voice choked, and then I heard him say, Jack. He gave me a bear-like hug. His body throbbed as I heard him cry. And this other poem is uh, dedicated to my father. I grew up on a farm in Oklahoma, and he went to the. He was called up in 1940 in the, in the to the you know the National Guard. So this is my father's hands. My father's hands were large and equal to the task. Held the plow handle, chopped the corn with the hoe. Fed his family in the stock all year long. But bought the school books and the clothes. They chopped the wood that warmed us all winter. Never spanked, but those large hands kept the roof. When war came, they made artillery boom. Bludgeons and battery and boxing ring. North Africa, they said Hitler's name. South Pacific sent the Japanese home. His brother's hands stayed home, made a fortune. After the war, my father's hands were set to the task of picking Yosemite, worked on the Colorado High Plains. Rarely were they ever folded in a crate, but like God, they were there when needed. Now they lay at his side to wait the next task. Thank you, Jack. I want to thank this committee. This is my last meeting as curator. It's been a great turn and a great opportunity. And I hope someone invites me back just to read <laughs> at some point. We will. Thank you. And Jack was a former curator, so I thought he should end it. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.